personally want to thank you. Listen, we reached our goal with the pizza, and we're continuing to reach our goal with the other building. And we couldn't have done it without you, so I'm looking forward to the closing. How many of you are excited about that? So, and uh, more and more stuff just keep, keeps happening, and so we're, we're glad. But how many of you really enjoyed that picture of uh, that big, huge machine where they were pouring uh, concrete? So if they'll put that up, I want you to see that again. They'll put that up. Look at that picture. Now, I want you to know that uh, as you look at that picture, everybody look at it. I want those that are watching, take a minute as you're giving. Look at that picture. Isn't that amazing? Look at how high up that is. Imagine the, how tall the structure is going to be for the sanctuary. It's probably even going to be taller than that. But we actually did take a picture uh, to follow, and I want to show you really what was happening uh, go ahead and show that picture. This is really what was happening. Look at that. So, Dr. Dr. Zorb came and he tried to release a spider with his little spaceship. Grab one of the workers. And there in the corner, Overtron called in for Captain Zepto. Captain Zepto, gather the team. Get here immediately. Dr. Zorb is remotely controlling... A giant mechanical spider and wrecking havoc. <laughs> so I want to give a shout out to Norris. He did that on his own. He sent it to me. <laughs> Norris is my illustrator. So I thought maybe those of you that were watching, you'd like that. Isn't that creative? He did a great job. Norris, we, here, hear the applause, Norris, if you're watching. So while we're, while we're talking about Norris and you're, you're still giving, I want to remind you and I want to thank you, first of all, Last week I mentioned about uh, going out to Amazon and not necessarily buying my children's books because I'd like for you to you know, go to hankandbrenda.org and purchase it through the ministry here because it just kind of keeps the project going. I agreed to five more scripts. Uh, is that what they call them? Scripts uh, for the, the first you know, video series, animation series. And so all that costs money and so I'm just trying to keep things rolling. But anyway, the numbers uh, of reviews increased on Amazon as a result of you great people. So I still need your help. Let's jack those numbers up higher if you really believe in what we're doing. And by the way, don't put one. You put four. Four means the best. Okay, just, just so you know. Or, or five means the best. What are we talking about four? I mean, let's go. We're exceedingly above. I was just testing you to see what you guys thought about it. But let's just go with, let's go with five. And uh, so go ahead and put up Captain Zepto. This is my latest release. You can see Norris's work. I'm the creator. I'm the guy that came up with the characters. I'm the guy that originally drew the characters. Norris, uh, obviously, he has taken it to a great new level. Uh, I can't, I don't have time to illustrate. I'm too busy. But this, this book just came out. It's really, really funny. You're going to enjoy that. And uh, I have um, another book coming out. I just talked to the publisher. It's coming out in September. This is my... This is Hank Kuhneman's version of a retold story of uh, Samson Delilah without all the smut. And uh, it's got Granny Z that wants to know the secret for Dr. Zorb of Zepto's popularity and strength. And so you're going to really like that one. So that's coming out. It's, it's hilarious. It really is. So you're going to really like it. Now, show the next one. So I have another series that you may not be aware of. This is for smaller kids. This is my latest book, Treehouse SSO, and you can see what Mutzfi's painting there. Um, there's a clue. He's supposed to, he needs help. They got stuck in the treehouse, so he paints SSO. And you'll just have to read the book to figure out why he painted SSO. So, but uh, that only had 10 reviews on uh, Amazon, and that is, I'm, I'm just kind of going out on a limb here. This is a great treehouse story. You're going you're gonna to love it. And um, do you understand the jokes? I mean, I just wondered if I have another Mutsby coming out uh, Christmas. I wrote another story, so it's coming out at Christmas. But go ahead and check that one out for the younger kids. All right? Okay, good. I think we're good to go. Amen. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles, and let's get in the Word of God. And I'll preach to you for the next little bit here. And uh, we're going to talk about the year of goodness. And I want you to look at Psalm 65. 
That's what we're going to open up with, verse 11. We're going to look at it, at it out of two translations. Let's look at it, first of all, out of the King James Version. And it says, God, you, watch this, you crown the year with goodness. How many could take that right now? You're like, hey, man, I'm going to take that. You crown the year with goodness. We're going to talk about what that word crown means because it's important for you so that you can enjoy a good year. And thy paths drop fatness. There's your diet plan right there, man. Everybody's going to drop fatness this year. Glory to God. See, I thought I'd share this on the first day of the fast, you know, we, so you all get, get encouraged that you're going to start dropping some fatness. But you crown the year with goodness and, and thy paths drop fatness. Now let's read it out of another translation so you can kind of get another idea. You crown, and part of that word crown is the word surround, okay? You surround or you preserve or you protect. That's another definition. So you could say you surround, you protect, you preserve the year with a what? Bountiful harvest. How many are ready for some stuff to start happening that's good for you? Say, I receive that. Just kind of say, I receive that, man. Come on. I receive that. And even the hard pathways. How many have been on a hard pathway? How many of you think that it's been kind of a difficult season for some? I mean, look, you know, we just saw something that happened. I was watching Monday night football and uh, last Monday night with the Bills and the Bengals. And uh, I was sitting there and all of a sudden I saw uh, a, a guy take a hit. And I said to Brenda, boy, that don't look good. And as soon as he went down, I jumped up and I said, Brenda, that man's going to die. You remember that, Brenda? And I, she said, point your finger. And I started pointing my finger along with others around the world and started commanding that man to live. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew I could feel it in my spirit. We were losing him. Damar Hamlin. And, and I started prophesying and said, no, you get back in your body. This is prophetic. God, this man will live. And I remember a prophecy from 2019. You know, this is all playing out. There was a prophecy from 2019 that said that there will be one, one, that will drop before the cameras. How many remember that? You, how many remember that prophecy? Yeah. And they'll say, what, what is this? And God says it will be a sign that that which they have done, not the person that dropped, but he's talking about the sign. Someone's going to drop in front of the cameras will be a sign of they, talking about others, who are acting as a puppet, who are lying, who's trying to deceive people. God, then he goes on and repeats it in the prophecy, and he says, and, and this one that has collapsed or will collapse will be a sign that this will collapse too. So it's, it's a sign. But then you go back to other prophecies. And how many remember, Anthony's trying to find it, but there was another prophecy when they were protesting and kneeling in the NFL. You remember that? I quit watching them. I, I, I'm like, you're not going to kneel in protest against the Constitution and the flag. Okay, wrong setting. And God began to prophesy, and he said, these that kneel, talking about the NFL and those that were kneeling sports, he said, I will do something that will cause them to kneel and pray. How many you remember that one? So there's a lot of these words, and think about what's happening. You talk about a year of goodness. God's been speaking about revival. You know, when that young man fell last Monday, the first thing he had to do was revive him. The whole nation was watching. This was a national, worldwide thing. Then, what did we be getting attacked with worldwide? Our lungs, our breath. Next thing you know, it, he gets revived. His breath starts coming back. And now, as of yesterday, thank you, God, the young man, Damar, his eyes have opened. He's writing, he's talking, and he's what? Awakened. So do you understand? God already prophesied some things ahead of time. And he's ta trying to get us to understand that, you know, there's people out there that are, you got, you got three categories, you got four categories of people right now. You got, you got those that they don't know really what God is doing. They don't believe that it's a year of goodness. So they're going to they're gonna go the way of it's the end times. And we've been in the end times since Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost over 2,000 years ago, Acts 2.16. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke in the last days. So the last days be begun. Yeah, but pastor, we're in the last of the last of the last days. Hold it. You can go to Matthew 24 and, and, and you can look at the wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in various places. You can look at 
nations that are rising against nation, Matthew 24. And Jesus had to say to him, but the end is not yet. He, he identifies, look at Matthew 24, verse 14. He identifies what will be the sign. Are you ready? And so these people who, they, they don't hear God prophetically in a prophetic office, most of them, so they have to hurry up and scurry to try to fit all the different current events to end time scriptures and eschatology or revelation. The Bible says the gospel, now that's the good news, so you could read it this way, the good news about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of God or the good news about God who is the Lord of the kingdom, Hank's translation, shall be preached in how much of the world? So it's going to be as a witness. In other words, there's going to be proof. There's going to be demonstration of the gospel or the goodness of God. Then, to all nations, then what will happen? Then the end will come. You go back and read the prior verses in Jesus, all the stuff that you see playing out, wars, rumors of wars, and all that earthquakes, to see uh, roaring, you know, come on, great waves and all that. He said the end's not yet. So we have to see an injection and a proclamation and a preaching of God's goodness before he wraps his baby up. That's what the Bible says. So you've got those. Then you've got others now that are the, they're, they're the total doom and gloom people. They, they don't understand that, you know, everything is doom and gloom. Oh, these are the worst days. Yeah, but you don't understand that we're in a season of the year of goodness of what is the divine separation of God. Okay, how many remember? We talked about it at the time uh, after worship where God separated Egypt from, from Israel and Israel from Egypt. Okay, look at Isaiah chapter, let's look at Isaiah 60. Sorry, guys, back there, I'm just throwing out scriptures. Verse 1, look at what it says. There's going to be something happening at the same time. Arise, shine, for what? The light has come. How many know light overcomes what? darkness and the glory of the Lord. So now it's not just a, a brilliant light in the natural. This is a brilliant light of God. It's risen upon thee. Now watch what's happening at the same time that this glorious, brilliant power is being displayed. Darkness will cover the earth. Okay, so it's happening. Darkness is, co is covering the earth and God chooses to arise and counter it. Okay, so all the doom and gloom, all they want you to do is see the darkness. And it says gross darkness. You know, that word gross darkness in the Hebrew is mental oppression. So a lot of people getting mentally oppressed, man. They're afraid. They're in anxiety. They, they, they think everything is over. It's all doom and gloom. But, but, but notice that word, but, 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 but. It's not just about gross darkness. It's not just about darkness. It's not just about all the gross darkness of people who don't even know, you know, G.I. Joe, G.I. Jane, and G.I. Don't Know Doll. They don't, you know, that's come out now. Notice the glory of the Lord shall rise up on thee. Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 2. Because people will quote this. Oh, but you don't know your Bible, Pastor Hank, because look, it is a day of darkness and gloominess. See, right there, that's what the scripture says. Yeah, but you have a comma and you have the, the letter A. So there's something in continuation or in addition. That comma is a separation. It's a day of darkness and gloominess, just like I showed you, and it's a day of clouds and thick darkness. Now, that clouds and thick darkness are the same Hebrew words, study it, in Exodus 19, Exodus 20, Exodus 21, and Deuteronomy, where God came down upon Mount Sinai. The Bible said that, that Moses even went into the dark Thick, dark cloud where God was. Notice, Moses went into the thick, dark cloud where God was. Part of the way that God manifested on Mount Sinai was a thick, dark cloud, and it's the exact same Hebrew words of those. So at the same time, you have doom and gloom, and you have arise, shine, the light has come, clouds and thick darkness, a visitation of God. So that's the second then the third thing that you have is people say, well, don't get your hopes up. I heard that on Flashpoint this last week, and I didn't get a chance to comment. But I'm going to comment now, Pastor Gene. I am going to comment now because it ruffled my prophetic feathers. Yes, get your hopes up. Here's why. You, 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 can, you say that, don't get your hopes up, when you forget to add something to your hope. Faith. 
is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'm not getting your hopes up. I'm trying to build your faith so that you will expect and see that the future is bright. All right, here's the fourth one. I'm a realist. Oh, really? You're a realist. Look at Joshua 14, verse 8. So were the ten spies. And look at what God said about them. They were so real that when God told them, I want to save a nation, I want to deliver all of the problems, I want to deliver you a, a, a nation, and I want to take out every single giant, everything that opposes you, and I want to give you a nation, America, that flows with milk and honey, and I'm sending 12 spies in, and they went into the promised land, and 10 of them were realists, and came back and said, oh, do you really know what's going on there? We are grasshoppers. Do you really want to know what the future is? Do you really want to know how ugly this is, this promised land thing? All you keep hearing is make America great again, milk and honey, but the the real truth is, the real problem is, is we got a jacked up Congress, a jacked up Senate, a jacked up uh, uh, a White House. Don't you really know what the real truth is? That's not real truth. And that's not, I'm not a realist. You sound like an alarmist. And look at what happened to the realists. God warned me when COVID came and all of this garbage was happening. He said, Hank, I tell you, I look for you to have a different spirit. Stay with what I've prophesied. Stay with what I've said and do not cave. And then he gave me this scripture. Nevertheless, this is Caleb talking. Caleb, who the Bible says in Numbers 14, verse 22, had a different spirit. Part of his different spirit was he could see different. He could see by the eyes of faith. He could also, six times it said he wholeheartedly followed God. That's what I'm going to do. I ain't caving in for nobody. Amen. You can write about me. You can mock me. You can call me this. You can call me that. I am wholeheartedly following God. I'm not changing. And here's the bottom line. I believe in more what God says than what you say about me. And what they're saying on the news. So there you go. Now here's the thing. That felt a little Italian like. So there you go. Now. Here's the thing. Nevertheless, Caleb speaking, he wholeheartedly followed the Lord. Six times it says it. God identified that him and Joshua had a different spirit. In fact, I've had two prophetic words over my life. When Jesus appeared to me in one of the visitations I had, he said this. And I don't often say this because I don't want to make you think I'm a squirrel. He said to me, he laid his hands on me and he prayed for me. And he said, you are known in heaven as Joshua. That's what he said to me. He said, that's what you have been called by me, and you are known. And I didn't know what that meant, and I had two prophets come in before. Some of you were in the room when the, the one uh, prophetic lady spoke and says, why is it that the Lord says that in heaven your name is Joshua? I was like, okay, I didn't tell anybody. And, and Jesus said something to me. He said, Joshua won great battles with his sword in his hand. You have an authority in your mouth. And when you speak, it shall be like the sword of Joshua. And so I'm very careful what I prophesy. I'm very careful what I say because I re realize that it's not just words. It's a wielding of something from heaven. Amen. The Bible calls about an assault from heaven. And sometimes God will use it. That's why it carries weight. It carries authority with it. Now, here's the point. Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit. I want a different spirit like that, one that sees, one that can see that it's the year of goodness. Nevertheless, my brethren went up with me, and they made the heart of the people melt being realists. Got him in fear, got him to back off of what God said, got him to doubt that God really wanted to make Israel great again. But I wholeheartedly follow God. And do you know what happened to those ten spies? The Bible says, you keep reading, that they died by a plague. And God said to me, he said, I am going to use this scandemic, pandemic, COVID, and it's going to separate who are going to be my pastors in the new era 
Who's going to be my spokesman in the new era? Who's going to be the TV people in the new era? Who's going to be on the media? Who's not? You watch. All this stuff is going to get shaken up and shaken out. And I tell you, there's going to be a whole lot of new faces and new things emerging. And it's because they didn't cave. Amen? So, I say all that because God's saying that it's a year of... Whose report are you going to believe? I want to believe the report of the Lord. Look at Psalm 27. The reason why, verse 13, the reason why some people, they, they cave in or they, you know, pull out their end time scriptures because, you know, they'd rather just escape, you know, God, uh, I'm looking for the yellow bus, you know, uh, to pick us up and get us out of here. Or they go the doom and gloom route or they, they think that, you know, we're just getting our hopes up or, you know, that, you know, hey, let's get real. Now, listen, I'm not saying be stupid. I'm not saying be ignorant. And that's not to imply that. What I'm saying is, yeah, you can, you can, you can honestly, don't put your head in the sand, but you can honestly look at things and say, hey, you know what, this is happening. But what you have to do is turn it around and mix it with what God said. And people that often will attack uh, and say, well, you know, the news is saying this, or we've got work cut out. Yeah, they, they're also ones that will oftentimes discount the, the prophetic word of the Lord. Okay, And so you've got to be careful with that, because what happens is, you know, there has to be the voice of truth somewhere. God's voice demands, God's heart demands a voice. His heart demands that it be heard. And, and so what God does is he speaks prophetically, and that always is, the highest form of information and truth is when it comes from God's heart through one of those that Jesus set in, his, in the office called a prophet. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God said in the church prophets. Ephesians 4, 11, Jesus set some, not all, in an office. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. I don't mess with the office that he gave me. I just report. So how many understand that? Now look at David. David was in an interesting situation. He's like some people today. They don't want to believe that it could be a year of goodness. They don't want to believe that God is a good God. And he said, I would have fainted. I would have despaired. I would have absolutely given up. Watch this. Unless I believed or reminded myself that I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Listen, when I hear the headlines on Flashpoint, and I'm sitting there and I don't read the news, I have to remember this verse. Man, that almost will make you faint. That's why I don't listen to it. But you know what, God? I'm going to remember and I'm going to look for your goodness because you've promised it to us. So always remember that no matter how difficult something may be, God in the end is the one that will always do good. As long as his spirit is in the earth, he always has a good and a redemptive plan for man. A redemptive plan is a plan of what? Help and a plan of hope. So if you're going to understand that it's a year of goodness, you've got to go back to those words, Psalm 65, and you've got to look at verse 11 again. Let's look out of, out of the New Living. And you have to see that God has planned three specific things. He crowned, it says. In other words, he's surrounded. He's protecting us from... You know, all the other things that might be out there in, in the world. You crown, you surround, you protect, you preserve our year with a what? Bountiful harvest. How many are ready for a bountiful harvest? Every one of you in the sound of my voice say, Lord, Lord I, am I am surrounded this year, this year every, day, every day with a bountiful harvest. All right, then get ready. Look at what it says. Hard pathways or no matter what journey that I'm on in my life. Okay, so maybe that's your story. You've been going through something. Say, Lord, Lord. I'm not looking at how hard things have been. I expect overflow. Overflow, overflow. 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 from your hand, from your hand. And, and abundance. abundance. I, receive I receive in this year of goodness, goodness. harvest, <laughs> harvest. Overflow, overflow and abundance. There you go. Amen. That's good. Isn't that good? You can give God a hand clap. Now listen. So where do you start? If, if you really want to believe that it's a year of goodness, here's what you have to do. You have to settle it in your heart. Who is God to you? Who is God to you? 
When David went with his mighty men back off of the war path, I guess you could say, from battle, they went back to Ziglag, their hometown. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 30 that they, the enemy came in and took the wives and took the children, took the cattle, burned the city of Ziglag with fire. And, and it was so bad that the men wept until the Bible says they couldn't weep anymore. And they were at one point going to kill King David, all of the mighty men, because of, they were going to blame it on him. And the Bible said something very powerful in 1 Samuel 30, I think it's verse 6. It says, and David encouraged himself in the name of the Lord, his God. It didn't say he just encouraged himself in God. It said his God. In other words, it came down to the point where he had to have a revelation of God for himself. That's why he said, I would have despaired, I would have given up unless I had remembered, you know, to, to, to know that God is good. So every one of you, it's the same question Jesus asked the, the disciples. Hey, what's the report out on the street? Matthew 16. Who do people say I am? And they said, oh man, you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, blah, blah, blah. But then Jesus turned around and said, all right, enough of that. If you're going to make it in this ministry, who for yourself do you say that I am? And only one man could really tell Jesus who he was. And he got it by revelation from the Father. And Peter stands up and says, Lord, you are the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon Barjona, blessed are you. Flesh and blood, not the word on the street, not a good sermon, but my Father has revealed this to you. So you have to have for yourself an understanding and a revelation of who God is. For example, if you think that, that a hurricane is God just killing people and it's an act of God, then you have a problem with God's character. If you grew up and your father was absolutely evil, harsh, abusive, whatever, then that's oftentimes how people identify with God. But you have to understand it's not based off of your experience. It's based off of what God has said about himself. God is not a liar. The Bible says, let God be true and let every man be what? A liar. So can you take God at his word? All right. So you cannot base your philosophy and all of that off of experience. or any, You've got to go ultimately with what God has said about himself. How many have ever been lied about? How many ever read something that you're like, man, that's not true? Why didn't they just ask me? I would tell them that's not true. Well, that happens to God all the time. He's constantly lied about. If you believe that sickness is to teach you something and it's given by God, you don't understand what God has said about himself and you really don't understand his goodness. God's not out killing, stealing, and destroying, and I'll prove it to you. Jesus said that. Well, look at John chapter 10. Look at verse 10 and 11. Jesus makes that argument very, very clear. God is not the one that is out absolutely trying to kill, steal, and destroy. That's not the nature of your God. John 10, verse 10. Now, Jesus is talking about the devil, and we know this. Jesus at one point said, hey, boys, because Philip came to him and said, hey, um, we, we've seen, we've seen uh, Jesus, I believe that's what he said. Or show us the Father. That's what he said. Show, show us the Father. And Jesus said, Philip, if you have seen me, open your eyes. If, look at me. If you've seen me, you've seen my dad. So everything that Jesus did, Acts 10, 38, the Bible says that Jesus went about doing good. And healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Right? For God was with them. So Jesus was an example of how the Father is in heaven and the Father's a good God. So Jesus is talking now. And he says, look, the devil comes and what the devil does is steals. The devil kills and the devil, what? Destroys. Now, there's a, there's a colon there. All right? Pause. Just like it's a day of doom and gloom and clouds and thick darkness. You have a pause because it's not talking about the same thing all right how many are looking at this you got to pause so he's saying all right the devil is the bad guy colon i have come in other words i'm bringing 
an understanding to you, a distinction that I have come that you might have what? Life. life. And what kind of life? A bad life? A life more abundantly. And that word life is the word Zoe. And what it means is, here's what it means. Here's what Jesus literally was saying. I've come that you might have Zoe. I've come that you might have health, divine health. In other words, you don't ever have to be sick. I've come to give you prosperity, soundness of mind, protection, rescue. Come on. And the list goes on and on and on. That's how, that's, that's, you know, we look at the one English word life and Jesus was just laying it out there. And he said, and not just that kind of life, but more abundantly. Amen. So God's a good God. Look at Nahum chapter 1. So look at what God said about himself. He's not a liar. I don't care what any preacher told you. I don't care what any experience that, that has happened that makes you think God's bad. Now, it's not that I don't care. But what I'm saying is that isn't going to convince me contrary. Okay? God's a good God. He's a great God. Man, when you get around Jesus, you would never for a minute ever bring an indictment. I, I, I remember when the Lord uh, came in one time on me, and I just was worshiping him, and I said, you're so good, you're so good, you're so good. It's the only thing I could say out of my mouth. And I feared him greatly. You know, not like I'm afraid of him, but it was like an like a incredible reverence. I would never bring an indictment against God. He is so good. And I've learned that, I, I, not only from Scripture, but in my own life. So the Lord is good. And you have to get this established in your life. If you understand and know that God is a good God, and it's not that it's someone's philosophy, but it's what he said about himself, he's a stronghold. So whenever bad things happen, don't just run, oh God, what are you doing? Oh God, America's going down the toilet. No, God's still here. And as long as God's still here, guess what? He's my stronghold. In the day of trouble. And you know what the stronghold is? All things, come on Romans chapter 8, all things will work together for my good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's always going to work out good. I don't care. It's always going to work out good. Amen? Amen? It's going to turn out good. The Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows them that trust him. He also knows those that don't. <laughs> I guess you could say that on the flip side. Now, look here. I want you to see Psalm 145 out of the New Living Translation, verse 4. Look at what the Bible says about our God. So if you're going to get a year of goodness, you've got to come out of one of those scenarios that I said. Okay? You can't just be hoping or say, well, don't get your hopes up. Well, what do you want me to do? Okay, I'm a man of faith, so should you. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Are you just a doom and gloomist? Are you an alarmist, a realist? Are you a, you know, end time person? You can't see anything else? I mean, some people have completely checked out of the earth. Because they're just waiting for Jesus to just escape and get us out of here. You don't know the goodness of God. Let each generation tell his children of your powerful acts. Let them proclaim your power. <laughs> I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. There you go. Come on. You, your awe-inspiring, wow, Lord, I'm going to tell that to you. Your awe-inspiring deeds. Lord, when I look, I just want to have a minute with God. Your awe-inspiring deeds that I see every time I drive into this plaza are amazing, and I just want to acknowledge that. All right. It'll be on my tongue. Yeah, I'll keep speaking it. I'll proclaim your greatness. I will proclaim your greatness, dead. There you go. I just had to tell him. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful. He's compassionate. He is slow to get mad. Not Hank Kuhneman, but God is. <laughs> and filled with unfailing love. I need to be more like him. <laughs> the Lord is good to what? Everyone. And he shows, showers compassion on all of his creation. The problem is they don't know it or believe it. All right. Let's look at, uh, let's look at, uh, uh, let's go to Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. Let's go there. So Moses now is having some time with God. And he literally, this is such a tender thing to me, you know. I often will ask God, I'm like, God, you know, one of the first people I want to meet 
when I get to heaven in old age is I want to check out Moses, man. And, and I mean, this dude, if you could talk God into saving a whole nation when they were down worshiping a golden calf, calling that golden beef Jehovah, and having a... Uh, I just, you know, there might be small kids in here, but they were having all kinds of perverted stuff going on. And God says, Moses, get down. Get away from me. I am going to kill every single one of them. I'm going to wipe them out. Really what it was is this, not that God killed. It's they are going to reap upon them what they have sown. Get out of my way. I can't exist with evil. And Jesus had not been injected in the earth. So they had no, 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 <laughs> it was just, they needed God. And, and one man, Moses, stood up in the face of God and said, no, God, you're going to remember these people, and you're going to remember your covenant. And one man saved a nation. I mean, what if Moses would have said, oh, come on, get real, God, you're right. <laughs> they are a bunch of creepy people. Look at how perverted they are. I tried to tell them a long time ago that they crave beef more than you. You know, the cow, you, you all got that? Yeah. That's no bull. And so, now God is with Moses. And, and look at what Moses says. So this is so fascinating to me. I, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I'm just like, this is so incredible. God, this is so amazing. So Moses, you know, with his long beard, he looks up and he says, Lord, I, I beg you, show me your glory. Now watch the first thing that God says, verse 19. God says, I will make all my, what? The first thing he says upon meeting him is I'm going to let you get a hold of all of my goodness. Some of you need to say that every day. Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy is following me this day. Lord, let all your goodness pass before me. Lord, let all your goodness pass before this campus. All your goodness pass before that construction. All your goodness pass before America. And then he says, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. So part of God's name is his character or characteristics. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will have mercy. Now go over to Psalm 34, verse 6. Now watch this. Now God gets ready. He walks by Moses, and notice what God says. This is so amazing, Father. And he said, I will make, uh, for, uh, Exodus 34, verse 6. He said, the Lord God. He says, the Lord, that's what it says, Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord God, as he passed by, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Come on, you don't think God has any mercy. You don't even think the Lord is gracious. And he's long suffering. And watch this word, abundant in goodness and what? And truth. So if you're going to have a year of goodness, you've got to settle it. God has said about himself that he's a good God. And don't you ever, ever call him a liar or bring an indictment against him. That will hurt him. And you know, there's one thing that we've got to get back to. And can I tell you, I am after God with something. I'm like, God, somewhere there's so many voices, so many perspectives, so many that are saying this and that. We have got to hear from you. And the only way that you're going to hear from God is you've got to pursue his heart. You've got to be so concerned about God's heart. This is why, whether you're over here or you're over here, when it comes to your choices in life, if you really want to go to another level in your intimacy with God, live your life this way. How will this affect the heart of God? Will this hurt him? I don't want to hurt God. I don't want to disappoint him. I love him so much that I always want to think about what is this doing to God's heart? You know, when we had the New Year's Eve service, people came to hear God. You know what I came to do? I came to make sure that his heart would be communicated accurately. And I don't know about you, but I was not scared spitless. I carried a, a strong fear and awe in my heart like God I don't want to open my mouth. I would rather say nothing. Are you here? So we have to think about God's heart this year. Let's just always make sure that we are checking. All right. 
the last thing before we close today. Go to Genesis chapter 1. If you want to have a year of goodness, notice Genesis 1, and let's look at verse 1. It's the first four words of the Bible, okay? The first four words of the Bible. And they, they are so important for you if you're going to experience the year of goodness. You've got to start with God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. When you get your paycheck, in the beginning of my paycheck, God. Do I honor God? When something happens in my life that I don't like, in the beginning, God. How you react and what you say in a time of trial usually is what will happen. Start with God. Start with God. Well, we're having problems in my marriage. Uh, begin your marriage praying. You know why Brenda and I are so close? Because I just say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> no. You know that's not, Brenda, you know that's not true. I do say, yes, ma'am. But then you say doubly, yes, sir. Yes, I do. There you go. Yes, I do. See how obedient she is there. You know. No, we, we submit to each other in the fear of God. That's what Ephesians says. You know. But we pray together, and we like to pray together. And, and I'm going to tell you, begin with God. You'd be amazed at how your, your life with your, your, your spouse, your marriage, everything. Begin with God. Start your day with God. Just don't start your day, you know, uh, complaining loathing that you got to go to work. Start with God. Take a few minutes. Start with God. Notice the next thing. In the beginning, God what? Created. So before anything was created, you have to start with God. People have expectations. Oh, I need a supernatural intervention. I need a breakthrough. I need God to answer prayer. Well, you want something created without beginning with God. You want something created or something to happen, but you're excluding the one that can make it happen. In the beginning, what? God. Now, watch this. Here's what God does, and this is why I won't back off of this nation. God looks at the earth, and the Bible says, watch the condition of the earth. The earth was without form. It's void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now watch this, verse 3. And God said, let there be light. So what did God do? He countered what was really happening. He countered. He didn't come into agreement. Oh, the earth's dark. Guess we'll never have people. Right? God, what did he do? He, underline, said. God spoke. Here's the thing. People oftentimes want to see something. So guess what he did? And this is so powerful with God. All right. And, and, and I wrote it down. So I want to say it exactly how I wrote it down in my computer here. He didn't speak his experience. He spoke his expectation. He didn't speak his experience. He didn't speak the problem. Oh, the earth is dark. He didn't even acknowledge it. He just said, hey, the earth is without form and void, right? Darkness upon the face of the deep. But what did he do? He did something about it. He spoke his expectation. See, if, if, if you, most people do speak their expectation. Oh, it's going to be a terrible Monday. Oh, I won't be able to pay for gas this month. Well, you're, you're going to get exactly what you're expecting. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Keep reading. Verse 4. And God saw. The light. Now go back to verse 3. God said it before, verse 4, he saw it. Most people only wait until they see it in order to come into agreement with it. That's not faith. You believe before it ever manifests that you receive. Some of you, you speak, well, I'm healed. But I don't see anything. He spoke. His expectations, not his doubt, not his fear, not his experience. God said, and then God saw. Look at verse, I think it's verse 8. Look at verse 8. You can see this pattern. And God called the firmament heaven in the evening and the morning with the second day. Now look at verse 9. 
And God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. In verse 10, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called sea. And God what? Saw. saw. You know how many times God saw before, or God said before he saw. You have to understand that if you want to have a year of goodness, you have to say it. It's a year of goodness before you may see it. Every day, you need to speak it. After every day, what did God say? Wow, it's a good day. What are you speaking about your day? Ah, it's an awful day. It's a terrible time to be alive. I've heard people say that. Oh, I don't like living in America. Well, you're getting exactly what you're saying. God called every day good. He spoke his expectation. In fact, Beginning with God, let's go back to the first verse, Genesis 1-1. We're going to close if they could come up here, please. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. you got to start with God. you got to prioritize God. And here's the thing. In fact, interesting notes of Genesis 1. The name God, or Elohim in the Hebrew, is mentioned 35 times, more than anything else. God is called He 10 times. God said 10 times. God saw seven times. Most people speak more what they see. Right? God said 10 times, saw seven times. He spoke, let there be 15 times. He rested two times, it said that God rested, even though he rested you know, on the seventh day, but it mentions it two times. So you have to put your, your, your you got to put things in perspective. So if you want to begin with God, what are some things that you can do? Number one is start your personal walk. Get on fire for Jesus this year. The book of Revelation says that if you're lukewarm, he's going to vomit you out of his mouth. Come on, get on fire for God. Be a radical Christian. Come on, you're a radical sports person. You're a radical puzzle putter together or whatever you are. I don't know where you're radical. But, you know, we all are radical about something. Brenda's a radical fish keeper. Oh, oh, she's an aquarist. Honey, that sounds like horoscope. You know the age of aquarist? Aquariums or whatever it was. So, you know, I'm a German shepherd uh, hobbyist. What's that? I'm a German shepherdist. There you go. Okay. But you gotta, you got to get on fire. Get on fire. You know how you get on fire with God? I'm going to tell you, one of the easiest ways to get, out of, get, get, get on fire for God is called the noun. Adjust the people in your life. If there's people that aren't godly, why are you spending all your time with them? If they're lukewarm, why are you spending all your time with them? I'd rather be alone than get around somebody that ain't serious. Number two, what places are you hanging out? Okay, they don't even have to be bad places, but you might be doing that, you know, like the, the lake and, and the boat rather than get you south to church or get before the, the live stream and be an e-member. Places and then things. What are some of the things? And if you'll just fix that and evaluate that, you'll be on fire. Number two, start your day in prayer. You know what Moses did? He set a time and he set a place for God. You have to do the same. Set a time, set a place. If you don't even bother to establish a meeting place in your home with God. Listen, people say, well, I, I, I don't have a place to pray. You know what? I find a place to pray. When I didn't have any place in my house, I went and prayed in a park every morning at 430 down in Bellevue. I even prayed in a graveyard many mornings until the gravekeeper one time came out and he's like, I was praying in strong tongues and he was with the shovel. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's going to hit me with that thing. He was freaked out. But I would, I would pray. Other times we had an out, uh, outside shed, and I'd go pray in the shed. But find a place, and let it be your meeting place. And then set a time. If you don't set a time, you know, it'd be like, you know, uh, you know some of you guys that want a date. Hey, man, I'd like to go out with you, baby. When? One of these days. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. That's not going to go over well. Same way with God. Set a time. Set a place and stay consistent. All right? In your marriage, be
Begin with God. Start praying together. Treat each other like Christ, man. No, not turn over the kitchen table and drive your wife out. We're not talking about that example. You guys are not even here today. I'm preaching great content. It's just like no answers out there. Okay, start with your finances, man. Just start honoring God with your finances. Tithe, put him first, give offerings. And lastly, stand to your feet. Your words and your outlook are so important. You have to. Look at Psalm 34, verse 12. Brenda gave me this scripture this morning. I thought this was fantastic. Psalm 34, verse 12. This is, this is amazing scripture. Psalm 34, verse 12. It says, all right. So let me ask you a qu Oh, you already put it up. I was going to ask him the question, but I'll just say it now. I, I kind of gave you the answer. Um, anybody here that you want to see good in the year of goodness? All right, let me ask you. How many of you want to see good this year? All right, those of you that are watching, I want you to say it. Do you want to see good this year? I think I can hear you. Look at what it says. It tells you the key. It starts with your words. Okay? And it starts also with your outlook. What person desires life? You know, you desire a better life, a good life. And you want to love many days. In other words, you want to enjoy life and you want to long, long days. Watch what it says. That he may see good. Oh, go back to verse 12. I've got to ask the question. What man is he that desires a good life, wants to have a long life, and wants to see good in the year of goodness? Verse 12, that's the question. How many of you? Raise your hand if that's you. Now, the next verse is going to tell you the answer. Keep your tongue from speaking wrong or evil and your lips from speaking guile. Anybody know what guile means? Deceit. Be truthful. Be a person of integrity. Do what you say. And I guarantee you, you will live a good life. Father, I thank you for every person as Pastor Doug comes that they're going to live in a year of goodness and there's going to be tremendous bountiful harvest, overflow, abundance. Lord, teach us to be like you, God. When we speak over our year and over our life and over our nation, our family, our finances, our job, everything, that, Lord, we will speak words of faith. Words, Father, that cause things to be created by the power of your hand and not the work of the devil who takes our words and uses them against us. I proclaim goodness upon every one of us this year, every day. Goodness and mercy shall follow us in Jesus' name. Everybody said? And also proclaim the shepherd who leads us besides Green Bay pastors. Oh, man. All right. I love yes, you, man. Amen. Great job. All right. Good Thank job. you, guys. I love you. Let's give it up for Pastor Doug, please. Give, uh, give Pastor Hank a hand. That was a great message today. How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord and hear about the goodness of God? Amen. God is so good, and he has a good plan for each of our lives. And uh, we all need to acknowledge him as Savior so that we can be on the right path and end up not only having that great life on this earth, but a eternal future in heaven with God. How many of you want to be there with him through eternity? This life goes quickly, but we have to be ready. We have to make the right decisions. You know, the decisions that you make on this earth will influence what you do and how you end up for eternity. Think about that. That's, there's a lot in that. The decisions that you make while you're alive on this earth are going to impact your future for eternity. So we better make the right decisions. And there's someone here today, I know it, I know it as much as I'm standing here on this stage, there's someone here and you're not serving God with all your heart. Pastor Hank mentioned that Jesus spoke and he said, if you're lukewarm, he'll vomit us out. And there's someone here and you're saying, Pastor Doug, I need to press in and make 2023 my year to serve God and, and, and do it from here on. And I'm not doing that. I haven't done it. I repent. I know it's wrong, but I need to make that decision today so that I can get on the right track, serve God with all my heart. You know, the pastor talked about John 10:10, 10, 10, what the devil's intent is. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to destroy you not only on this earth, but he wants you to be in hell with him for eternity. That's his desire. 
And I don't want to see that happen. God doesn't want to see that happen. I want you to bow your heads with me right now. And I'm going to ask you to make a decision today to step out, be bold, and serve Jesus Christ all the days of your life. Because that's the way of blessing. That's the path of blessing that we all need to be on. And I'm going to count to three today, and I want that person, and there may be a several, and you may be some that are watching online, and you say, Pastor Doug, I need you to pray for me. I'm going to be bold today. What Jesus thinks is more important than what people think of me, and I'm going to make a decision to serve Jesus Christ. And I'm going to do it not only just by coming to church, you know, occasionally. That's what you've done. You've been here occasionally, but you haven't been faithful. You haven't really pulled out all the stops to make God first in your life. You're not only going to start attending church faithfully, but you're going to serve him all the days of your life when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're at church, wherever you're at. You're going to make him Lord of your life. That's what he wants. He wants you to be willing to be submitted to him so that he can be Lord of your life. Who is it today? I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to have you raise your hand quickly, and I want you to be bold today. And I'm going to ask you to actually come up here and meet me right up front. It won't hurt, any, it hurt you at all. We're just going to pray together. And it's going to change your life forever. And you're going to make that decision. And we're going to all stand with you as a group and say, we're going to rejoice with you. You know, the Bible says the angels rejoice when we come home, when we make Jesus Lord of our life. One, two, three. Three, I want you to raise your hand right now. Whoever's in this room, I see one back here. Who else is bold? You say, I don't want to go to hell. I want to serve Jesus. I want to do it all the days of my life. I want to make him Lord. Who else is? There's more than one, I believe. Ma'am, you just come right up here. We'll open this up for you. Anyone else? There's got to be someone else here. I just know there is. There's someone. You say, I've been in church a little bit, but I'm not serving him 100%. And I want to make this today. I'm going to come up here and be bold with this lady that made that decision today. Give her a hand. Okay. I'm going to give you one more chance, one more chance to get out of your seat and come up here quickly. You can still do that. Okay, if you're watching online or if you're here today, we're going to pray to together and I'm going to have you repeat after me. And this is going to take care of this once and for all. And you're going to make the decision to follow God. And he's going to come right down and meet you where you're at take you hand in hand and you're going to follow him and your days we're going to be blessed and glorious from here on what's your name ma'am kathy. kathy i'm so glad you're here kathy god bless you let's pray together okay you repeat after me father in jesus name thank you that i can make a decision on this earth to follow you and you'll meet me right where i'm at Thank you for sending Jesus. I believe that he went to the cross of Calvary. He died for me. He was buried and he rose again. And today, I repent of the sin in my life. I invite Jesus Christ to come into my heart and be my savior. Today's a new day for me and I will serve Jesus all the days of my life. Amen. And Kathy, because you prayed that now, you're in, you're back on track, you're going to serve him all the days of your life. Alder team, come up here and let's meet with, uh, you just walk over there and Kathy, they're going to pray with you and give you some literature today. The rest of the Alder team can come up here if you need prayer today for anything going on in your life. Uh, the Alder team will be glad to meet with you and pray with you. A couple quick things for announcements and then I'm going to get you to move on out here for our next crew that's coming in. Um, do, how many of you remember that this is the start of our prayer and fasting time between now and the 30th of January? Today's January 8th, right? This is the start. And if you need information on what to pray for, how to fast, if you're watching online, you can go to hankandbrenda.org. Go to hankandbrenda.org. There's a fasting and prayer banner right there. Click on that. And the information that we have available for people here is out there. You can join with us in prayer for the needs of this church and the, the world and this nation. And if you need a sheet, go to the information counter today, those that are here. It's down here on your right as you exit. 
and the information counter will have that information. It's called a prayer and chat fasting um, sheet that will actually show you uh, when our prayer groups are meeting here and give you some prayer needs that you can pray for individually. Don't forget Winterfest, February 3rd, Henry Dorley Zoo. Tickets are on sale today in the Connect Shop, $24 for an adult, $10 for children. We're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship in the church. There's a buffet meal provided. Uh, you'll also have entrance to the Scott Aquarium. It's going to be a great family night. Uh, make sure you get your tickets because we only have a limited amount. Oh, for those of you that were asking about the Biblical Citizenship class uh, that's sponsored by Patriot Academy, Rick Green, how many of you have seen him on Flashpoint? We're going to be doing that in March. So uh, we've got that set up and we'll give you more details on that. Those of you that are interested in how to be a...